Meine Damen und Herren, ich darf Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to cordially welcome you here, uh, dear friends, uh, to the presentation of the European Energy Atlas. So, um, uh, these four people here on the panel are going to be introduced to you in a minute. Uh, before, though, they are presented, I will present you uh, the, the the starring role, which is the Energy Atlas, the Energy Atlas, and what's in it. The Bird Foundation, some of you uh, may know that, uh, has uh, had a great tradition in presenting complex issues, uh, explaining them in the form of an atlas, so that it is uh, uh, information uh, readily comprehensible. So why have we done a, one on uh, this complex energy situation? The foundation has energy coordination at all major European offices, uh, i.e., we have lots of competence here uh, on this issue. Uh, secondly, we have an energy coordinator, a European energy coordinator here in the HQ in Berlin, uh, and uh, she has found out that uh, the awareness in the Berlin energy scene on the fact that also the German um, <coughs> energy transition will only be successful if it is only done on the European uh, level is a fact that is not so known. That's why we introduced a European energy uh, saloon uh, uh, that is uh, held regularly. And that was also the reason to publish this energy uh, atlas, this energy atlas. And the third um, reason is, um, on a European level, uh, we are currently seeing the negotiations for um, the uh, of the climate goals for the European Union for the year 2030 and for the new European clean energy package. So it was at least three good reasons to uh, publish uh, to. Um, compile and publish this energy atlas. Many of you will uh, have it for the first time in their hand. When I had it in my hand for the first time, I thought, my goodness, uh, we are in a uh, challenging phase. Still, many things can go wrong. Uh, I thought when reading this, uh, it may happen that uh, coal uh, policies will prevail in national states. It could still be uh, that we have uh, a lukewarm, uh, um, unwilling, say, uh, um, intent to implement this this energy transition and uh, and too much lobby interference uh, in in watering down the climate goals. And uh, one thing. Up and traveling uh, Central and East Europe a lot, uh, and uh, well, and fuels are not fuels. Uh, coal, uh, you know, uh, is linked to enormous regional identity, and identity means uh, votes. Um, so there is not an ecological uh, resistance, but also an economic resistance against the energy transition. Well, this is not what's going to be uh, this energy atlas about, but this atlas shows in very nice graphics and, and, and colors uh, um, what opportunities this energy transition has. So, so showing the potential, how can we tap them? And the more people know about these potentials, <coughs> and uh, the more people read this atlas, um, uh, the more um, probable it's going to be that we implement these these opportunities and, and make them a reality. Now, uh, the first uh, thesis I already mentioned in the energy atlas, so energy uh, uh, transition will only um, be successful if it is done um, Europe-wide. Um, there is here on that page, there's 12 uh, uh, things if they are done. Uh, and if you act accordingly, uh, then we can uh, uh, realize the uh, opportunities. Um, uh, there's always two arguments that are uh, said against transition. Some say it's completely uh, not feasible to do 100% renewable, and secondly, it's too expensive. You can't afford it. Now on page 22, 
There is a graph, uh, 100% renewables. Um, that is a, a forecast, so to speak, a um, by 2050 for uh, 10 selected European countries. You see that the south uh, of Europe, that some countries are missing. Uh, uh, about, uh, of course, that uh, Italy and Spain have a high share of PV and solar, would have a high share of PV and solar, so that is in 2050. Um, so a prerequisite for achieving 100% renewable by 2050 is a sectoral uh, uh, coupling, only bringing together power, heating, traffic. Uh, it's possible uh, to balance the loads uh, out where there is imbalance on account of renewable. So only if we master this, uh, challenge, then we will have 100% uh, renewables and and a, and have a connected European uh, gen uh, energy infrastructure. The second argument against the energy transition is that it is too expensive. Of course, uh, investment into technology will always cost money. But uh, if you invest, there is also a return on investment. And in terms of renewables, uh, the ROI is extremely high. The health costs would go down, energy uh, security would increase, uh, environmental costs, which are frequently not taken into uh, consideration, which are not calculated, uh, through gas, through coal, through oil imports, etc. These costs would also decrease and also, jobs would be created. That is a graph that you'll find on page 23, a price tag for a clean Europe. Um, and uh, the second column, zero emission, investment share is much higher. And what best then uh, in area where you have meaningful investment? So I mentioned some of the advantages. What are the uh, advantages of energy transition in Europe? Jobs. Until 2014, one million new jobs have been created in the area. Wind, solar, biomass um, in, uh, in Europe. What you also see in this um, global chart, and if you look at that very big chunk here, that big circle, China, Europe needs to make an effort um, if it wants uh, to um, be competitive in the area of investment in renewables, because otherwise China would take over and, and USA would take over and other countries would also. Um, and if you look at solar in, 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 in Germany, um, so that was not a very good example. So investment conditions would need to be the right conditions. Um, and, uh, and we, however, know that the industry is on our side. So page 13, uh, job through renewable energy, on, uh, that's in the atlas as well. Uh, uh, another argument. Um, against uh, energy transition is uh, this buzzword, energy poverty. I believe energy poverty is, is, is a no-no. Um, I mean, people have no money in order to heat their houses and to switch on the lights. There's nothing to do with the fact uh, which fuel produces uh, the power or the, the, the heat. Uh, so it's a um, political issue. It's not energy poverty, it's poverty. But of course, this factor has to be factored in as well. Well, you find a, a chapter on that on page 21. Quality of life for European citizens. And we see in this graph clearly, uh, clearly that in the Southeast and East Europe, there's an enormous problem here, uh, yeah, i.e. the question is, can people afford to, to uh, heat their homes in winter, etc. We'll be hearing more about this on the panel later. 
um, uh, the energy transition will need to um, f provide answers. Um, uh, the European energy transition is a transition to the benefit of citizens. So if a citizen is not just a consumer, but also a presumer, a generator of energy in the energy market, then then the energy poverty issue would be a completely different one. So please, uh, I, I recommend you read this on page 21, which brings me to the next point. And uh, you have the normal uh, hiccup. Uh, and so here, empower the citizens would be the next uh, uh, headline. And the question is really, do uh, European citizens participate um, once a technological change uh, becomes a participatory one? People accept it because they see it's good for us, it's good for our environment, it's good for our uh, municipality. Uh, we see here that 125 million EU citizens uh, would be could be uh, uh, involved in solar energy uh, um, production. So one fifth of the system could be producers. So twice as much um, power could be generated this way than with the nuclear power plants today. So huge potential. Um, that is also a success factor for the European energy transition, that it is not in the hand of a few major uh, uh, utilities, so that the, the current s structure is changed and that there is ownership of as many people as possible, uh, that this is really developed uh, for people uh, joining forces. And there are very interesting analyses and facts uh, about this in the Energy Atlas. That is from page 16 here. So we've come to a very decisive issue already, um, or where I, which I touched upon during the sectoral coupling already. Um, the prerequisite for uh, a energy transition for the citizens is that we use the opportunities that digitization provides. And if that's done well, uh, it would serve the project 100%. So you see in this graph, uh, these many small uh, energy uh, producers which uh, uh, network, uh, their energy that is generated needs to be uh, transmitted into grids, so that all needs to be coordinated and uh, has to be then coordinated with the final consumer. So there is a huge need for digitization, for smart technology control. So it's a very uh, interesting uh, uh, chapter on digitization in this context. On page 33, I recommend you read this. Um, uh, you must not err, though. Of course, surveillance, uh, proprietary software, and all these things will play a major role in this context. Uh, that's why um, when uh, making the energy transition possible through digitization, it is to be made sure that uh, this is in line uh, with uh, the data privacy regulations. A very important point uh, to conclude my brief presentation of the Energy Atlas last um, section, page 47. Um, the Heinrich Böll Foundation has a major expertise, uh, not just in, in their offices in, in Europe, but also in Russia and the Ukraine, and also energy policy of the Eastern Partnership. Uh, 
and uh, Europe is uh, highly dependent, and what that you see here in the energy atlas, it's highly dependent on a couple of countries where it uh, imports energy and gas from. Reducing this dependence is a clear objective of the European Union. With the uh, um, accelerated expansion of renewables, uh, this uh, objective could be achieved much faster and better than with any other means. And here uh, we see um, that uh, Russia is the major uh, exporter here of oil and gas. Uh, Europe is too dependent on Russia in, as regards oil and gas, and that's why uh, we from the Heinrich Böll Foundation don't think it is meaningful to build more pipelines that increase that uh, dependence on, on, on Russia and at the same time um, put at a disadvantage our eastern neighbors uh, politically and economically. So this is a brief outlook on the European energy community and the things that are discussed uh, with the Eastern partnerships. Now I have um, um, taken you uh, very rapidly through, through uh, what is in that atlas that you have in your hands. We will now go into detail regarding these uh, issues. Uh, uh, on the panel, and also you will be um, invited to uh, raise question. Uh, and I will pass the floor on to Becca Bertram, which is our European uh, uh, Energy Coordinator here at the HQ. Aristina uh, Primova, also please stand up. Uh, she, she's our energy coordinator in Brussels. The two, uh, Rebecca and her, uh, have uh, well, bore the main brunt of uh, setting up this atlas. So that's worth a round of applause. And now we go into the nitty gritties and uh, have the this, this things discussed in more detail. Thank you. Uh, Ellen, uh, welcome uh, to the Heinrich Böll Foundation. My name is Rebecca Bertram. Uh, um, also welcome to the people in the adjacent room and to the people that follow us uh, on the live stream. Before we start our panel discussion, I would just briefly roll a video here. I've been on this job for a year. I was uh, previously uh, in Washington for the Heinrich Böll Foundation, and I still uh, wonder today why is Europe so important for a successful German energy transition? And Stefanie Groll and, and myself and the other colleagues in, in, in the uh, foundation have um, made this little film for you. So let's roll the tape. No translation. <lacht> Vielleicht auf die große? Ja. Wohin ging's? Fangen wir mit einem kleinen Rückblick an. Im Jahr 2000 beschließt Deutschland den Ausbau von erneuerbaren Energien wie Solarkraft, Biomasse und Windenergie stark zu fördern. Gesetzliche Grundlage ist das Erneuerbare Energiengesetz, kurz EEG. Damit war Deutschland eines der ersten Länder, die die Energiewende beschlossen. Europa und die Welt beobachteten diesen Alleingang interessiert und skeptisch. Durch die Förderung der Erneuerbaren konnten auch Bürgerinnen und Bürger aus dem Klimaschutz wirtschaftlich profitieren, indem sie eigenständig in Windräder und Solarpaneele investieren und sich somit an der Energiewende beteiligen. Zwischen 2000 und 2017 wuchs der erneuerbaren Anteil im Stromsektor von 6 auf 36 an. Heute arbeiten in Deutschland ca. 330.000 Menschen in diesem Sektor. In Zukunft werden wir noch mehr Strom brauchen, zum Beispiel für Wärmepumpen oder Elektroautos. Ökostrom ist das Gebot der Stunde. Denn Strom aus fossilen Brennstoffen ruiniert Klima und Gesundheit. Und Atomstrom hat ein zu großes Risikopotenzial. 
Die Stromversorgung mit Wind und Sonne unterliegt natürlichen Schwankungen. Klar, mal bläst der Wind, mal ist Flaute. An sonnigen Tagen gibt es viel Solarstrom, an wolkigen weniger. Für ein Industrieland wie Deutschland ist die Versorgungssicherheit immens wichtig. Was also tun? Der Stromhandel mit dem Ausland und die automatische Anpassung des Verbrauchs sind kostengünstige Flexibilitätsoptionen. Für diese Flexibilität ist es hilfreich, dass Deutschland europaweit vernetzt ist. Steuerbare Kraftwerke, die man hochfahren oder drosseln kann, geben zusätzlichen Spielraum. In der Zukunft werden neue Speicher nötig sein. Strom kann in Batterien, Pumpspeicherwerken und durch die Umwandlung in Wasserstoff gespeichert werden. Noch ist das zwar teuer, doch in Zukunft wird es günstiger, dank des technologischen Fortschritts. Europa bietet für diese Herausforderungen die Lösung. Denn Europa ist bereits gut vernetzt über den Binnenmarkt und Stromautobahnen. Aus deutscher Perspektive ist der Stromhandel mit Nachbarstaaten gut für die Versorgungssicherheit. Und die Stromanbieter freuen sich, weil sie Überschussstrom exportieren können. Doch für Polen beispielsweise ist der überschüssige Strom aus Deutschland eher ein Störfaktor. Denn es muss auf seine eigene Netzstabilität achten. Und wenn billiger Strom aus Deutschland ihre Netze flutet, verdienen polnische Energieversorger weniger. Deutschland und die anderen EU-Mitgliedstaaten müssen ihre nationalen Energieinteressen anerkennen. Diese sind in Europa unterschiedlich. Polen setzt bisher auf Kohle, Frankreich auf Atom. Da ist Diplomatie gefragt. Gerade jetzt, wo die EU über ihre Energie- und klimapolitischen Ziele für 2030 berät. In der nächsten Phase der Energiewende muss Deutschland besser auf die Interessen unserer europäischen Nachbarn eingehen und darlegen, welche Chance eine europäische Energiewende für die gesamteuropäische Wirtschaft, Gesundheit und Gesellschaft aller Europäerinnen und Europäer bedeutet. Auch aus deutscher Perspektive muss man sich eingestehen, dass die eigenen Energie- und Klimaziele nur im Europäischen Verbund erreichbar sind. Auf Ökostromaustausch sind letztlich alle europäischen Länder angewiesen. Steigende Anforderungen, zum Beispiel an Luftreinhaltung und gemeinsame Klimaziele in der EU, verpflichten alle Mitgliedstaaten. Zudem entscheidet sich auch die Wettbewerbsfähigkeit europäischer Industrien daran, wie ernst es die Politik mit Energiewende und Klimaschutz nimmt. Der Weltmarkt für klimaschonende Produkte und Prozesse ist riesig und wächst stetig. Regionale Kooperation und Bürgerenergieprojekte zwischen den europäischen Nachbarn können hier den Weg freimachen für 100% Erneuerbare. Davon hätten alle Europäerinnen und Europäer etwas. Weitere Infos zum Stand und Herausforderungen der europäischen Energiewende findet ihr in unserem Energieatlas. Davon. So of course every, everyone would benefit from it, everyone in Europe. So this is the end of the little film and I would like to start now with a discussion because we would deceive ourselves if we, if we thought that the European uh, energy transition is being led by some, only some countries. Every European country and every citizen has to benefit from it and I hope that we will understand a little bit better today where the major challenges lie in Europe. First of all, we have Ms. Dörte Fouquet, who is the director of the European Renewable Energy Federation, and uh, she's one of the best experts in of the European energy debate. I'm very happy that you're here today. And there's also Margarita Smolak, She's from Poland. She's the energy director for the energy program of Client Earth in Poland, where she in particular deals with pollution standards and the decarbonization of the energy sector. And last but not least, we have Jules Hébert, on the panel, my colleague from Paris, who is responsible for the energy program in 
France and to also deals with the cooperation of Germany and France and tries to foster the cooperation. I'm very happy that you're here on the panel. Now I would like to start with Dörte, just a brief question at the beginning. Today we heard from Ellen that Europe will discuss the 2030 climate objectives. Um, and I would like to get more insight from you. What are the challenges? What are the difficulties? What do we have to decide by the end of the year in order to reach those stages where we want to get to? Um, good evening. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you very much for the invitation. And also thanks to you, too, for the development of the Energy Atlas, and um, I could also participate or support you in the writing of one of the chapters. And my task, um, it has been my task for several years, and I'm a lawyer by profession in a German um, legal uh, office. And I'm also uh, head of the uh, Federation, and the Federation is responsible for the national uh, federations um, and associations in the field of renewables. So all the single renewables associations like Wind Energy Association, Biogas Association, etc., are represented in our federation. And of course, it's our task to uh, review the legal framework in Europe and how can we improve the access of renewables um, in the single member states. And the debate about the so-called winter package or clean energy for the Europeans is very important right now. There are quite a few different regulations that are being reviewed right now. And for us tonight, the most interesting might be the guideline on renewables. Now we have a guideline that will um, end in 2020, and it was the first European guideline with fixed um, objectives with fixed targets concerning renewables, uh, also at the level of the member states. And the overall objective is 20% renewable, 20% efficiency, and 20% less emissions. And the current state in our debate is, and this is something you need to keep in mind, is that uh, most of the European member states will not be able to meet the targets. Some will uh, fail um, blatantly. I'm looking to France or the UK. Of course, the UK is, is leaving the EU, but they are still part of it. Um, and there is one trend that, and I've been in this uh, in Brussels since 1991. I went there as a um, civil servant and I stayed there as a lawyer. And there's a trend that I've noticed over the years in the course of the liberalization and also renewables, which is that the objectives were never met. So the first targets were the targets for 2001 of the 2001 guideline, indicative targets per member state. And then the following happened. That was the debate about the new guideline. And then the following thing happened. People said, well, now we're getting binding targets. So this is why we do not have to make it public that we didn't miss our objectives. And this is the same situation right now. And then the following situation emerged. And you've shown this in the atlas. There's a lot going on in many member states or also in, in, in different regions of the member states. And in Poland, for example, things are changing, in particular among the citizens. There's a change of heart there. Um, but still, there's this uh, trend or the question, what I'm going to do with the uh, conservative energy sources? And of course, they are um, um, uh, against this new uh, development in some areas. Areas. And this led to a situation where the Council in 2014 put pressure on the Commission to not set up an ambitious objective, an ambitious target for 2020. And this is why the Commission came up with 27 percent binding only at the European level, no binding objectives at the national levels. However, this led to a situation where, astonishingly, the European Parliament 
um, tried to fulfill its task, even though it was no longer as green as in the past or as open as in the past. However, um, the in the key guideline, um, the parliament said that the objective of 27% cannot be missed. So we might already reach this target in 2022 20, uh, or 24. And this led to a situation where the um, parliament criticized the so-called impact assessment of the commission. And if you take a closer look at it, it's really astonishing. They um, included technology prices on the path to 2030, which are much higher than they are right now. So this way, they really uh, miscalculated it. And the commission once again fell into the trap and said, well, the emissions trading prices will try will, will reach uh, three digit figures and um, then of course they said 27% is quite ambitious however this was criticized by the european parliament and the parliament now calls for 35% thanks to a good french diplomacy and an excellent management we had um, quite remarkable uh, paris result which was not included in these assumptions and then the commission was put under pressure by the parliament um, to recalculate it. This is a calculation that was never done and never published. However, the commission did something else. They commissioned IRENA, which is the International Renewable Energy Agency, what could be achieved, so what they think Europe could achieve and I was also invited to the event. I, I was allowed to assess it. And then the Secretary General from IRENA came up and also the um, General Director for Energy and the Commission for Energy. And they came together and published the IRENA results. And IRENA calculated at least 34%. So this led to a 30% target by the Commission. So this is what is happening right now. And the Council, and this is the important thing for you right now, well, our government was unable to do it. And of course, you could exert some pressure on the government over the next weeks, because right now the Council and the Parliament and the Commission in a so-called trilogue are trying to come to an agreement on the overall package. But right now, under the Bulgarian presidency, the renewables guideline and also the governance regulation and it's also the the market design that is being discussed and this is why it's very important right now to exert pressure on the governments to leave aside the 27% and to get rid of those 27% um, and to make a l greater commitment and and from my point of view, this is one of the main challenges right now. And we might talk about citizen participation later on. Um, but if we always say, well, Europe is lagging behind, this is true. The Commission was not ambitious. But the biggest obstacle is the Council. And this is usually forgotten by the member states. They go home, back home, and say, well, Europe, it, it was very difficult to achieve something. But what I see is that it is not really ambitious what is being discussed right now in Europe and what is on the table. There are very good approaches in the winter package, also good um, formulation by the, by the Commission, but the ambitions of the different member states is quite low. And the reason for it is that the member states are highly dependent on coal, or member states like France are dependent on nuclear power. They are already trapped in a kind of difficult situation. I don't want to, to um, 
or put differently, uh, to, uh, this morning I, I already mentioned it, we heard that more than 300,000 people are working in the renewables energy sector in Germany and France. 160,000 people and more are working with EDF, the state-owned energy utility. And then there are many others through subcontractors who are working in, for this energy utility. So this group is actually representing the state in France. And this means that we have to be cautious. We have to be find a way out of this stalemate. How, and in Germany, the 300,000 people who work in, in the lignite industry is, um, I mean, a relatively low number. Thank you very much, Dörte, for your contribution. I have one further question. You mentioned that in Europe we do not have any binding national targets and we are not discussing binding national targets. And, of course, this weakens the uh, overall objective as the member states will not be able to hold accountable for um, not meeting any targets because there aren't any. And the national energy targets or strategies that you have to devise, do you have, together with your immediate European neighbors, do you have to discuss them? And this leads me to the regional cooperation. So I would like to ask you now to go into more detail here about the regional cooperation. This uh, leads me to the governance regulation, governance directive. Here we try to get some binding targets that were not included in the energy uh, guideline. And there are many interesting aspects in s included for those member states who want to achieve something together with their neighbors. You just mentioned regional cooperation. This has been a focal point um, by the rapporteur Claude Thomas. Uh, some of you might know it. Uh, um, Greens um, MEP um, from Luxembourg, and he introduced some kind of formula into the Parliament's proposal. So, if the member states transfer this formula into the national energy plans, then we will once again have binding targets, which unfortunately the people in the council have already understood. And so far, um, things are on the move. However, there are very good approaches in the governance field. Of course, it's become more and more complicated for the member states. It would have been much easier if they had agreed to binding targets and national energy plans. And now they have to make a huge effort and might be frustrated in the end. However, my hope is, um, and I was talking as a lawyer, um, I was at if in the past guideline of 2001, our first guideline for uh, the power generation, we only had indicative targets for the member states, but at least we had them. There was an annex as well, appendix, and um, I don't know the figures by heart. I'm very bad with figures, but at that time, the member states already needed to submit plans to the Commission, rough plans, though, but plans, how they want to achieve or reach their indicative target. And several member states like Austria, Portugal, Sweden, the water hydropower uh, states um, included an asterisk to their indicative target, and they said if it's a dry year and we have only a lot of hydropower, then it's not applicable. And at that time, I also submitted a complaint um, on behalf of the uh, Federation and said, well, it's not going to work like that. And if the plan is as such and there's an indicative target, then from our point of view, the whole thing becomes binding. And the interesting thing at that time was that the Commission agreed to my viewpoint. We did not have to go to the tribunal. Thanks to the governance regulation, I could well imagine that. And I think it would be great if this regional cooperation would work out. We try to do this with the support mechanisms, which aren't running that smoothly. However, the idea isn't wrong. So why should the wind power plant on the one side of the Rhine not be allowed to cooperate with the wind power plant on the other side of the Rhine? And I hope or what is missing in Europe. 
is that Germany and France are cooperating much more. I think we'll come back to it in the course of the discussion. Um, you represent um, a country, and we hear about Poland and energy. We're thinking coal. 80% of uh, the power uh, generation is coal based. Is there a changing awareness in Poland? Are there hints in Poland? that uh, this uh, this uh, thinking uh, might change or, or is there a pattern like the daughter one has just said that uh, that uh, that um, they they will cling to coal interests as long as possible or are there is some hints in terms of uh, rethinking uh, as regards um, coal power generation in Poland Gmix is um, based on on coal. In the overall uh, energy mix, uh, um, including heating, electricity, and transport, it is uh, uh, coal and lignite. It's uh, almost uh, 50 percent, and renew renewables only 11, and uh, out of which. 80% is biomass uh, used in heating. So um, the situation is not, uh, right now it's not very good. Uh, however, we can observe that uh, on the, the decision making um, level, um, the politicians um, uh, are understanding they, they cannot block uh, what is going on in Europe and around the world, and they, that they cannot block energy transition. Uh, and on the society level, uh, people are uh, understanding that uh, coal is the main cause of air pollution in Poland, and especially coal used uh, for domestic heating. And uh, there are uh, many uh, initiatives just um, by individuals to produce also energy. And our pr uh, pr um, prosument market is growing uh, quite quickly, uh, both in uh, solar energy and the uh, heat pumps in uh, in heating sector. Um, so uh, we hope that uh, uh, the energy transition will come not only by law, by um, binding targets, but, but also from uh, citizens, from the uh, citizens movement. Darf ich kurz nachfragen, weil wir auch im Atlas ein uh, We have a chapter uh, on the role of cities in the Atlas. Um, I, uh, the last time I was in Warsaw, it was winter. And there was smog. Uh, it was similar to China, really. It was really bad, actually. Um, now, are, are cities involved in this? Um, is there uh, a rethinking in, in energy uh, uh, supply? Uh, not maybe on the national level, but uh, you mentioned citizens level or uh, com community level here yeah, or municipality level. When we are talking on uh, the local level, uh, it's uh, related mostly with air pollution. Uh, so, so whatever actions are taken by the local authorities, municipalities or regional level, it's connected with the, the demands of citizens to take care of very heavy air pollution. And um, it's all connected with heating sector. And it's uh, important to mention that most of the heating utilities in Poland are owned by the local governments. So uh, the changes in, in energy sector in heating sector probably will start from the very local level, while electricity s sector is on the higher um, national level and by uh, its responsibility also of the state-owned companies. Okay, vielen Dank. Ich habe noch mal eine Nachfrage an dich, um, und zwar... I have another question uh, to you, Ellen. Um, 
mention it, you indirectly uh, touched upon it, uh, that energy uh, transition is not just a technological uh, uh, challenge, but also a societal challenge. You'd have to provide alternatives for the population. You have to you know, offer uh, jobs for people uh, that still have jobs in, in the fossil fuel uh, industry. So uh, you must not ignore this. Uh, and as long as you don't show alternatives, you will not make progress socially. The EU Commission was now saying uh, we've uh, understood the problem. Uh, we earmark now um, monies in a just transition uh, fund, uh, which goes directly into coal regions in Europe. Uh, providing them with the support for restructuring on a local level. Is that just something that's being discussed in, in, in Poland? And then Polish regions uh, would be eligible for this. Is that being discussed in, uh, in Poland? Uh, is that a possibility to start uh, discussing structural change? Is, is that an issue in Poland? Is that discussed? It's uh, mostly discussed among, uh, among uh, NGOs and think tanks, much less on the uh, high politi political level. Uh, however, I absolutely agree with you. It should be discussed, and it's, there is uh, much more or opportunities than risks. Uh, Silesia, which is our mining region, is uh, the richest region in Poland. Uh, so it's quite easy to transfer uh, this region from coal region to industry region. There is a lot of infrastructure, but a lot of jobs can be created easily. And moreover, from the energy transition into renewables, into a less centralized energy system, uh, we could provide also jobs in uh, the regions which are much poorer than the Silesia region, and uh, where, uh, uh, for example, wind, wind farms could be built or solar energy farms could be built. Okay, vielen Dank, Jules. Frankreich. Um uh, thank you, Jules. When we talk about Poland, and then when we talk about, uh, we talk about, or think, coal, and when we talk about France, we think nuclear. And we hear that you want to uh, say at least uh, partly farewell to um, nuclear power, and now you we, you hear no, not so much, and and you wanted to go from twenty uh, until 2025 from 75 percent to 50 percent in terms of uh, power generation uh, through nukes. Uh, what's happening in France currently? Uh, yeah, we are at a crossroads in France. Uh, France is known for the um, uh, uh, nuclear power plant, uh, generating up to 75 percent of the power, uh, not just uh, Fessenheim or Katernum uh, near the German border. We have a total of 19 uh, nuclear power plant with 58 reactors in, in France. So for decades, um, there was a political uh, consensus among all governing parties here, yeah, um, which is that uh, nuclear power is part of the grandeur of the uh, grand nation. It's part of the national uh, uh, pride and is to be continued. And now, Uh, it is no longer presented as the pride of, of France, but rather a solution to the climate change. Um, but that comes at a very high price and at very high risks. Um, risks are enormously uh, are increasing. They're becoming older and older, these, these nuclear power plants, 34 years on average. At a, for a maximum life of 40 years. And uh, reports show that the security issues also in terms of uh, terror attacks. Uh, reports that are partly not uh, being publicized because they're too sensitive, uh, because they in, in, in include too many uh, sensitive information. And 
also the maintenance and the uh, uh, extension of the life of uh, nuclear power plants uh, would cost 45 billion, uh, according to uh, EDF and the. Uh, the uh, the French auditors are saying that it could be up to 100 and and uh, 110 billion euros. So enormous costs um, for an energy policy which is not uh, sustainable. And that, despite enormous potential for uh, renewables in in France, more sun in France than in Germany, and coast coastal uh, lines where you could install lots of uh, wind farms and and other uh, things that generate uh, renewable energies. So there's a change in the Doors course, though, um, since 2015. Uh, was uh, the Socialist and the Green Party uh, green in 2012 for new targets. Energy transition was passed in the parliament uh, with very, very ambitious uh, targets for France. And renewable energies until 2030 to be in, um, increased to 40% of the power generation. Uh, that was uh, the deal or, or the, the intent. And the uh, nuke share is to be decreased from 75 to 50 percent by the year 2025. That was the, the objectives at the time. These targets were very ambitious. However, there was not a detailed plan for the implementation. Uh, 2017 was a turning point. Uh, in terms of the energy transition discussions, all candidates had differing uh, opinions. Um, uh, some say it, uh, immediate exit uh, right down to um, supporting nuclear power with the new nuclear power plants. And Macron, who was very open in this electoral debate, said nuclear power industry is a very important industry, but uh, the question of e economy has to be raised. Now, uh, energy uh, uh, transition uh, is not uh, a mere green issue. So all the other parties are also uh, discussing it, which is astonishing enough for France and good for France already. Uh, and uh, but there's also a mind change in the in the in the uh, general population. There's many municipalities, many cities now in France, which are pioneers of, of the energy transition. They uh, define their own goals and pursue their own policies in that um, area of energy. And a, a poll has shown that the majority of the French population is in favor of developing uh, uh, renewables, uh, uh, then investing into, into nuclear power. So that is a very important change in the debate. Can I just to jump in? Uh, uh, I was told when you talk about energy policy in France, you, you never talk about nuke. Yeah. You talk about energy transition, but you never touch upon the nuclear issue. But now you tell me you had a great poll uh, where you found out that the majority of the French uh, advocate uh, energy transition driven by citizens. Is there now a discussion, an honest discussion on energy policy in France now? In the population? In the population? Yes. Well, look, this poll. We did that in uh, uh, December. That was during the One Planet Summit of uh, Emmanuel Macron. And after this, this issue here, make our planet great again. Great, great again. Uh, so opinion is changing in France. Uh, French uh, learn more and more about energy policy. Uh, in the past, it was an expert uh, issue only. Um, I'm, um, I'm very happy um, uh, about the discussion in Germany, where many citizens uh, talk about uh, energy transition uh, in concrete terms and uh, social change, etc. In, in France, uh, this is a more recent debate than in Germany uh, in comparison. That will change. And, uh, 
and in Germany there's more experience. Uh, the general population is more experienced in Germany, and that needs to be uh, changing in, in France as well, so that the government is uh, 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 living up to that. Uh, but what I'm hearing is that there's no honest energy uh, discussion because you don't want to touch upon uh, nuclear. No, no, there is a um, public debate organized by the government in France. Um, uh, Hulot in uh, November announced that the targets for 2025, i.e. the reduction uh, of the nuclear uh, a share in the, in the power mix is not realistic, but it is in the law, i.e. we need to change the law and define new targets uh, so that uh, political credibility is retained. Now, But now you have this debate in France now. And with uh, uh, Hulot, uh, Hulot is the environmental minister in France, uh, and was a green activist. Uh, there was big hope attached to his nomination um, uh, as an environmental um, uh, minister. And uh, now his position is more ambivalent than when he was an activist. And now he's saying, for, on the one hand, uh, we have more, we have uh, freedom to decide than uh, like never before in terms of energy in France. Uh, and, uh, uh, on the other hand, he defined two scenarios in the public debate uh, which foresee a, a slight reduction of nuclear in the uh, power mix, um, plus uh, promoting renewable, uh, plus promoting power exports. And here comes in the European uh, dimension. If France now um, produces a lot of uh, nuclear power and renewable power and export it, does Germany want to buy power from obsolete French nuclear power plants? And also the question of introducing a CO2 minimum price. That is a question that is pushed by Macron a lot. Uh, that was something also that was discussed in the negotiations in Germany. CO2 minimum price is a good uh, instrument for climate policy in Europe. Uh, to discuss that is good. However, if there is a CO2 minimum price and no um, uh, phasing out of nuclear power, meaning uh, France would benefit and Germany not, and when we talk about European cooperation, it is cooperation. And uh, if France was to introduce this CO2 minimum price, then there would have to be a clear sign also that uh, France uh, is intent to say farewell to nuclear power. Otherwise, there will be no political deal. And, uh, uh, and uh, Sven uh, Schulz and uh, Mr. Lo are now uh, doing initiative to talk about these issues. It's very, very welcome. Uh, we have Macron, a clear European. Uh, we have, at last, a German government, uh, which has uh, European energy policy objectives in the first chapter of the coalition agreement. Uh, that needs to be discussed now as part of that European project. Uh, that is something uh, um, where you can instill trust uh, in the European citizens with this decentralized uh, 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 energy transition, um, bringing more trust in, in, in the European Union on the French and, uh, and the German and the general European level. Dörte, do you want to comment on that, on these uh, proposals coming from France and how they are received on the, on the European level? Uh, we've already talked about it uh, this morning and also in the discussion between the panelists. This is quite an interesting development. And I would rather say we have to acknowledge that in the 1950s and 1960s, nuclear, the nuclear industry has, in many European states, including Germany, uh, has been the um, 
energy uh, generator, and I can still remember um, older RWE uh, board members who said, well, we weren't given uh, m money, um, oh, the only money we were given was for the development of nuclear power, so we weren't given another money. Um, so, of course, we should not hide behind that, but um, it might be very interesting also for France and for the dialogue on the dismantling of the nuclear power plants and the distribution of costs, which is a very or has been a very interesting dialogue in Germany. And on the one hand, the power plant operators needed to provide the funds that they had still available. But on the other hand, society will be in the debit for the next thousand years concerning the waste disposal. But when you just say that France will change the law and take a step back, then this leads us to the, the, friend, uh, the, the Belgium company Enedis. Um, in Belgium, we also have a phase-out law, and it has been altered two times. We still have a phasing-out law. However, the, the date for the phasing out of nuclear energy is being uh, delayed, and these are French reactors. And the phenomenon that I do see in Europe is that Belgium in particular, Spain to a certain degree, and France in particular, <clears throat> want to delay or want to want to extend the the lifespan of the nuclear power plants because they do not have funds available for the dismantling. Of course, we could say, well, um, you're that's wrong, or we could talk about a transition fund, as you've just mentioned. I mean, it's difficult. I am, I've am. i been a civil servant in the energy law sector as after um, the Chernobyl um, reactor explosion. And, and of course, now, I mean, it's difficult to say, but we now have to help EDF to get out of it. Of course, um, uh, here we have Rebe and EDF, two people standing uh, no longer capable um, of, of acting. And the state is putting more and more funds um, into their hands. And of course, this doesn't lead to our objective. We need to provide support here. For example, take Fessenheim. The, obstacle for quiet nights in, in Germany and in Luxembourg and also in France, or just think of Catanon and say, we are going to do this now. We're going to make this a joint project, a joint dismantling project. I think Areva would be the right place. It would be a um, job um, creator, but some things are missing. Um, we need to do this in common, and this would be a great project for the two countries. We would also take away some of the pressure here. And now I'm talking as a lawyer. I was against the um, expansion of the lifespan of two reactors, not uh, to two reactors in Lyon and Lyon. And um, right now, the debate is quite good because next to the energy package, Europe is also discussing the structure of funds for 2020 to 2026. And we should keep up the polluter pays principle to everything that EDF has and France uh, can find needs to be put on the table. However, we should support France. Then the debate would be completely different. And I don't care about any vent de couleur or couleur de vent, um, so they can just dream of it. So if there was a consensus on taking those outdated power plants off the grid, then we can have a real and genuine carbon dioxide discussion. Ju, would you like to reply to it? Well, I think this is basically a very important question, the question of the waste disposal and also the dismantling of power, nuclear power plants. 
it is also a question of uh, an exchange of experience between Germany and France or where we can learn from each other. And I think this also includes an economic potential for EDF and Alvia um, Onano, and this could also create jobs. This is also an answer, could be an answer to the constant question of the um, destruction of jobs or the loss of jobs in France. Now we talked about the German-French cooperation. We have developed a few ideas there. Margot Schatter, um, Germany and Poland, from your point of view, is there a cooperation or possibility for cooperation in the field of energy that you would like to present to us here? I really would like to see such a cooperation. However, on the high political level, right now it's quite opposite. and. Uh, uh, Polish government is uh, even afraid of flood of uh, uh, German electricity coming from renewables. So uh, I don't see much prospects for it right now. Yeah, unfortunately. Okay, ich würde jetzt um, gern die. Okay, right now I would like to invite you and the audience to take part in the discussion. Um, and maybe to the people in the next room, if you have questions, please come into this room and ask your question for those who are watching the live stream. Unfortunately, it's going to be impossible. We're still working on such a solution. So are there any questions from the audience? Oh, several questions. Okay, then we will start at the back with the gentleman with the blue shirt. Okay, I'm going to try it in German. Could you briefly introduce yourself and who the question is directed to? My name is Ruby Angeli, and I'm working for a collective in France called Collective Climate 2020. And it's like a think tank, and they suggest a cli finance climate pact. So the question is, how can we finance the energy transition? Because this is also a major question. And the proposal is that the ECB, the European Central Bank, could provide funds for it because right now the ECB provides money, but only to the to the banks. So what do you think about this idea and what could be the possibilities at the European level to, to finance this uh, energy transition? So the question is directed to you. Well, I think it's a very interesting question to use the ECB in this case. As a first step, I would rather opt for the lower hanging fruits. And there's something very interesting um, in the French-German relations. After the First World War, France had a bank for the reconstruction of France. And this model was given to Germany, which was or became the uh, Bank for Reconstruction in Germany, the Kredit Anstatt für Wiederaufbau. Unfortunately, France has stopped running this uh, bank, and in Germany, the Kredit Anstalt für Wiederaufbau was the bank that got the Marshall Fund, and it, it is still the most important fine financial provider for renewable energies for the citizens. For us. It started with the 1,000 roof program, which became a 100,000 roof program for solar power, solar panels. The program is no longer there, but um, it has been financed from the German budget. And they have funds available exactly for these kind of tasks. So, I was wondering, and you obviously have 
had a similar institution before Hollande. Um, you started it. I can't remember the name. There's such an agency that's already there. I would suggest that you take a closer look at how this bank is working and how it's structured and managed. So I think this might be a better solution than revolutionize the European Central Bank. Of course, we should also take a closer look at the World Bank, and I'm serious about it. But due to this lack of time for achieving our climate goals, I would rather suggest a partnership and that this bank needs to be more clear about where to give money to or the funds to. We are not billionaires, of course. We all have received funds from this Kreditanstalt für Wiederaufbau in Germany, the KW, uh, KFW. Um, and I would rather opt for this than an ECB reform. What's the name of the agency? Uh, this is the Kreditanstalt für Wiederaufbau. Um, it's the KFW in Germany. Yeah, the, the green T-shirt uh, participant <coughs> Kaminsky, Humboldt University, Konstantin Kaminsky, uh, Institute for Slavic Languages, Humboldt University, Berlin. I have the um, impression that people are uh, a bit frustrated uh, in, in Germany on account of that uh, um, diesel gate and also one thought that uh, one could have a, a pioneering role in the uh, um, renewable energy market here in Germany, but uh, that hasn't turned out. Um, the Chinese uh, took over and they are number one. And they are number one in terms of filing patents for this. So the question is, um, well, where do we stand internationally in terms of exporting renewable energy uh, technology? Um, specifically also with a view to cooperation uh, projects with uh, Poland. Uh, uh, because we have to talk about uh, balancing interests in and the question is, would, uh, would Germany be prepared to do the energy transition using Chinese technology? We're already doing this. Uh, just very brief. Uh, I mean, um, f f out of bare necessity. Uh, we have the SME structure in Germany. And then we said, uh, if the first power uh, feeding law, if you look at it, uh, we always uh, said um, we want to reduce uh, dependence on imports, we want to do more renewable. So, and it was never a uh, climate thing. It was always an industry policy uh, thing in Germany. And uh, indeed, we have uh, withered here, and others have uh, taken over. Uh, it's like with your film that you showed earlier. Uh, you have this strange Germany, uh, uh, this funny Germany here, that all of a sudden does this feed-in tariff. And then in 24, 5, 6, 7, then the American companies uh, looked at that, uh, that had these small boutiques in the US already. Uh, they did thin film PV already. And all of the world uh, looked at Germany and, and, th and, and thought, aye, there is money to be made. And then uh, there was companies setting up production lines in uh, East Germany, and they were here active for a while, and then they've gone. I'm not, I wouldn't say that there's broad frustration in Germany. Uh, not sustained uh, frustration, uh, because there was also these quality issues. And the question is, if I uh, get the same warranty, if I buy a, a Chinese PV panel, 
Uh, and if I understand it, um, Matthias, can you tell me uh, uh, Germany, I think, is still leading in terms of patents. It's not just uh, setting up a production line. If I look at the first solar uh, production site in Frankfurt Oder, I was a consultant for this company. Uh, there was people working there because it was 364 hours and around the clock. Uh, production. Uh, the money is now earned uh, in uh, the intelligence and the management and the control and the sectoral coupling that you mentioned, not in production. And that uh, and this br the brains you can still export very well and you can still make a dime with this. If you look at that chapter on digitization in the Energy Atlas, it is very exciting. Uh, so digitization is a good tool for me if uh, the ideas are uh, uh, smart to sell these I ideas in a smart way. If the idea is shit, it remains shit, uh, digitization or not. And China, at the beginning of that development, uh, massively subsidized uh, into their production uh, um, uh, sites, only um, produced for exports, and they didn't have the transmission lines. And that has changed completely. Uh, this, um, this, this funny uh, president, uh, this president, funny guy acting president uh, uh, in the U.S., um, he he uh, may provide conditions for expanding renewable energy in the U.S. Uh, of course, the Germans are always frustrated and always lament on the high level. Uh, so I've been living in abroad for many years, so I don't take this lamentation th seriously here. Yeah. Two, two ladies here claiming the floor. Hello, good evening. Elena Aksovanov. Free University Berlin. Thanks for this exciting discussion. My question goes to Ms. Dr. Fouke. I actually have two questions. We heard that uh, successful regional cooperation with the neighboring states is uh, essential for the success of the German and the European energy transition. Are there um, existing successful formats of such cooperation in Germany or in other countries. And my second question, what role does Germany play in the current negotiations regarding the EU climate goals for 2030? Is Germany a driver or not? Thanks. I start with the last question because that's a tricky one. Uh, Germany is a driver uh, in terms of, of bringing about a reasonable government structure. Um, uh, um, we try to square the circle. Um, we don't have a bindingness, but how do we get it? Uh, and I worked for the federal government then, uh, together with the research institutions at the time. We tried. Uh, to um, introduce certain guidelines. Example, if everyone sends their national programs to the uh, commission and commission does calculation and says there is a gap. I couldn't hear the word gap for, for uh, months because we always mm, talked about gap, gap, gap. Um, and now, through Norway, one tries uh, through that certificate trading. It's uh, every time we get a new directive, uh, this, this has a renaissance. Um, they say certificate of origin and uh, certificate trading. Uh, here, Germany is very, very, very um, attentive. But where Germany is reluctant is in the area of uh, setting targets. I don't know what they're waiting for. So a very soft stance, and it would be good if we could exert pressure on the German government. I tell you something that's not fair. 
uh, if you look at the the horror show of the next presidency of the European uh, Union, which is changing uh, every six months, uh, we will have Austria coming next. And that government, which has the presidency, uh, unless it is a strong member states, can't be a driver, must be a mediator, must find compromise. So Germany must help Austria urgently to make progress, and France must do the same thing, make to make progress in the next six months, and uh, next year. Uh, and Sweden as well. If um, Germany would uh, join forces with uh, Luxembourg, Denmark, uh, Sweden, and Austria, then it would be helpful. The European elections will be in May 2019, 23rd of May, I think. So this packet has to be finalized um, by the end of the year. So the clock is ticking. If you have an influence of the German governance, exert that pressure. Now, on the European level, uh, things are done. I'm not talking about the tendering and where Denmark uh, took all the free spaces, uh, because a Danish uh, free space is different than in, in, in Germany. In uh, Denmark, you are allowed to, to use arable land. Uh, and the radiation arg argument uh, is uh, nonsensical because the efficiency of the panels has increased. You can set them up wherever you like. But there still needs to be right cooperation. With the city utilities from uh, Trier, they have that idea of the energy honeycomb. They uh, uh, submitted that uh, um, uh, uh, as a, a research project in, in, in uh, the Horizon. Uh, they're not starting from autarky, but they're saying uh, renewables is very local, it's distribution, uh, what is missing is uh, this or that from the uh, honeycomb next door. Um, uh, we have now the phase shifter to Poland, but times will change, we will be friends again. Uh, it will be over when these old guys um, uh, have uh, b bitten the dust. So uh, maybe when I'm still active, I would be very happy to see that day. Um, but um, I think uh, regionally we could do much more. And uh, we have the covenant of mayors, um, uh, this corporation of mayors here. They will move much more, presumably, than uh, the others here, uh, like between charter of cooperation between Lorraine and Germany and what have you. You already have these uh, charters of cooperation. And the winter package I like. Should we continue here? Thank you, Dunkelmann, 8KU. I wanted to comment on the last theme. And, and it's now three things I would like to comment. Patents, uh, Dörte, we were, a month ago we were in India. We were at a trade fair. And, and if you look at India, a trade fair on power generation, it's three times as big as that part of the Hanover Fair for that. And it's local people that want to buy stuff. Uh, they really want to know what they can do in, the, in terms of energy supply. It's not to say that we have um, uh, not, uh, that, we have, that, that we have lost uh, uh, the, um, the, the trailblazing. They would love to have renewable energies overnight, but it is not possible. Um, and that's why they still built uh, these coal-fired power plants and also buy some nice um, nuclear power plants from our wonderful president of the neighboring country, France. 
and so so still complex uh, systems complex issues um, how that works decentralized there's examples in Germany like Trier um, and uh, and the sectoral coupling is in that energy atlas. What does it mean to have various different fuels on the local level? Power is only part of the energy transition. To bring that all together on the local level, that you have a pre-structured state um, for uh, fuels then for heat, for storage, etc before you start pushing that to the next level, to the transmission grid level, i.e. Uh, city utilities, city utility uh, alliances, decentralized approaches. Um, and uh, we are at the Green Party, we are at the uh, Heinrich Böll Foundation, and they like decentral. And these approaches must be promoted which brings me to my actual um, comment. In the film, I see uh, lots of Europe, and that Europe was composed of transmission grids. But it will not work, for one, because um, we uh, increase risks on a European level. In Poland, there will uh, not be a new approach overnight to modernize the energy system, i.e. you will still have an old power plant fleet um, which is prone to distortion. And that's one reason for that phase shift. Uh, and, and therefore, uh, expanding the grip, grid could also be exporting risks. Uh, the week before Eastern, 8KO are major utilities, Nuremberg, for example, and others. And we started uh, a process to have, until 2015, the metropolitan area of Nuremberg 100% renewable power, heat, etc. Uh, and we had lots of many different politicians in panels and discussed how can we do that, bring these sectors together, uh, couple them, see um, uh, how can we bring energy from energy system one to energy system two. And that is grassroots energy transition. And that brings me to the question of you back, uh, Dörte. Uh, that can bring uh, something that can be exported, brains that could be exported here. However, but centralization, decentralization, there's still lots to be done. Thanks. Um, I would like to compile a couple of questions. We're still we're already late, and there's still lots of questions here. Let's start with this gentleman here in the, in the front. Uh, Institute for Ecological uh, Economic Research uh, in the energy transition. We talked a lot about power. Now, energy transition is done uh, because we have a climate problem. Power plays a little role in this because only 20% of that energy consumption, i.e., if we bring heat and power together, we only have 15% in Germany. There's still 85% to go. So, which uh, weight will heat have in that uh, European winter package? Hi, uh, Tom O'Donnell. About energy and international affairs at Hertie School and at FU here in Berlin. Um, just two things. One, one thing is uh, I, I, I expected somebody might mention something about transport because it's such a disaster. And um, uh, I, I don't, I, I, my impression, I'd like to see your response. My impression, in, what I find in Germany is this idea that the perfect is the enemy of the good. 
when I talk about pragmatic solutions that can really knock down things, like, for example, why aren't buses run on natural gas instead of diesel all over the country? Like, in my country, they are. Um, it's, oh, no, we're going to have everything electrified by 20, whatever, 20, 20 2030 or something. And so, and so it would be a waste of time. And I don't really understand this, especially in light of the disaster with the diesels. Um, the, I would just, and then just a quick comment uh, for Dr. Foucault. I think, I'm, I'm afraid that your comment, respectfully, your comments about the solar industry, um, it's a, I think you have to take this a little more seriously in the sense that 16 of the major solar companies here are, out of them, only three are not bankrupt. Okay, and this is a country that export, 43% uh, of the GDP is dependent on exports. The United States is only 19. And part of the pact, the social pact with the energy vendor was that these companies would be protected by the government in some way. And China was clearly cheating, and the government didn't go to the WTO, got cheap panels to install, and we know what happened. Uh, exporting um, intellectual property doesn't make up for all those jobs, and you know how the jobs have gone down in that sector. I know it's complicated, but... Okay. Um, that lady here. University of Jadrina, Frankfurt Oder. Um, so I have a small comment. Um, we uh, and and then a question. <laughs> um, so we speak always of of uh, French German cooperation, which I'm all for. Um, but why wouldn't we do a Weimar a, a Weimar Triangle um, cooperation? I, I mean, I get that this is difficult right now, but still, I think um, it should be taken into more consideration. Um, uh, yeah, and, uh, to Frau Dr. Fouquet. and for Dr. Fouquet, I would like to ask it the following. The, uh, the state of the citizens' energy. Uh, um, you talked about the COP earlier, and there is enormous tension here between the Parliament and the Commission, and maybe you can comment on that one. And the last question? Uh, here, and then first row. Billy Rinkman, I'm a member of the Green Party. I have the following simple question. The Energy Atlas 2018, or for the future objectives, uh, uh, is the um, uh, trade uh, with China priced in in terms of customs duty? If these uh, customs duty would fall or if they would increase, um, how would that decelerate the energy transition? And is that part of the energy atlas? And then the last question here. Yeah? Thank you. Justine, Stanford University, I was working for the Green Party here as an intern uh, currently. The first slide that Ellen showed um, showed how dependent Europe is on energy imports. So that is a uh, security risk, uh, but also strengthen international cooperation. If it is about renewable energy, then the discussion appears to be focused on how we push renewable energy in Europe. Uh, and this, mm, this death attack discussion has to um, be gone. Russia, um, I think, uh, plans to export uh, power to Russia, uh, to, to, to England, etc. And my question would be, um, um, is there uh, a plan to uh, import uh, CO2 neutral energies from uh, Russia, Norway, and other countries? A good question. Do we start with heat in the winter package? And the most questions are directed, if I'm not uh, erring here, uh, are directed to Dr. Fouquet, isn't it? I'll try that. I'll come back to the solar panels and then uh, switch to English. Well, heating and electricity in the winter package. 
I think we have quite uh, meagre objectives or targets in the winter package. And what the member states do with it uh, is up to them. And this is something to do with our EU treaties, um, where we have a split uh, responsibility and not a European responsibility. So there are certain limitations in this regard. The package tries in particular concerning transportation and heating to uh, embark on a better path. And however, there are not, no binding targets. There are more definitions on the heating sector, more definitions on sectoral coupling, and of course, um, states that um, or member states that want to make use of it can make use of it. St member states who do want to ignore it can ignore it. And this is also something that the colleague from the Hertie School of Governance has already mentioned: heating and transportation uh, in Germany and in many other member states as well, is the Achilles verse. And what is happening with transportation in Germany is what the British would call despicable. Well, there's not much to say about it. And also the round tables that have been conducted in the chancellery, or together with the federal chancellor, mm, the more interesting aspect about it is, is who was not invited. So, um, but I think here as well, people will vote with the ignition key, and then the next generation will be there. My youngest son is 24, who uh, does not want to get a driver's license. I did my driving license with 17 and a half. So there's a new generation coming up, and things are on the move, luckily. But now I would like to say a few words on the solar industry. Just remember when this um, downturn came about, there was an unholy alliance of um, wishes. We pampered the solar industry. And if you can remember it, we had PV uh, in terms of more than 40 cents on the roof. Uh, for the rooftop solar panels, and a beautiful industry could be developed based on that. This was not this was not wrong, but at that time some companies opted out. They did not want to take part in this development, and they used these very comfortable uh, tariffs in order to um, put down this large sector like RWE or E.ON, the large electricity utilities, they wanted to put an end to this sector. And at the same time, the Chinese came to the, onto the market, and they also wanted to benefit from the great tariffs. And they had margins that one could only dream of. So this was one of the few industries that had a major success. Um, and however, then there was this abrupt end. And here, we were lacking the backbone of the government to say, well, we will continue with that. And then there was the issue of the corridors. Of course, they weren't wrong. There was nothing wrong about the corridors. But it was too small scale. And this led to the situation we're in right now. But we did um, approach the WTO at the European level. The EU um, put import tariffs on Chinese silica panels and also additional materials. So it w we did not do nothing, but it wasn't sufficient. And the Chinese are also very intelligent. They did it via Pakistan. And Pakistan gave them the advantage of a tax-free um, trade. And as their development country, there were no import restrictions on Pakistan. And this led to this imbalance. So there are several factors that chimed in. Um, I think that the government um, did not react in the right, at the right point of time, and the companies did not keep up. And some of them who did were worse off in the end. This was really um, bad. 
And uh, one aspect is also that the large utilities did not were not on the path they, were, they are on right now. Now I would like to come back to, to Frankfurt or the Viadrina University. Um, I agree it would be nicer if there was more cooperation. Uh, but I would like to uh, pass this uh, question uh, to France and Poland. So I'm going to take back my uh, answer, my statement, and then uh, you can take over. Um, what was the other question? Uh, well, the imports. Uh, can I say something on that? So desert tech. Well, now I'd like to come back to what Matthias Bumann has just said. She's, uh, I've been working in North Africa, we're cooperating with the GEZ um, to provide the necessary framework conditions, and I've done that for many, many years. I was always against Desert Tech, not because, and I also tried for the German government to set up contracts, state contracts between Germany and France and also Morocco on the other hand, for the construction and also the import of what is that solar thermal um, electricity to Europe um, in Spain because the current directive requires renewable energy from a third country that it actually reaches some point of Europe. We do not want to achieve a trade just on paper. But this did not materialize because uh, Spain was in a crisis and they said, well, why are we supposed to take electricity from uh, Morocco? But Germany supported the construction of was that of the two um, thermal power plants in Morocco under the headline uh, industrial export policy and also um, development aid. But what I thought was absolutely disastrous is that Desert Tech had many white elephants in its own uh, operation. And who became a member of Desert Tech? Those who were against PV expansion um, um, in a decentralized way. And they became partners of Desert Tech. And they said, well, we're going to do this in the desert. And then we do not need the decentralized plants in Germany anymore. So. This is not necessary with the renewable energy technology. They are decentralized. And uh, young states need their own transition. They need the electricity. They need the power in order to develop their own countries. And then we come to the final question. If we lack 10%, for example, then we like to take it from Morocco as Morocco likes to take 10% if they are lacking 10% uh, from Europe. So this will come, this will happen. But we should, I mean, we are destroying our energy transition when we wait for these major projects um, in other countries. I do like to work in those countries, but I know that they also need their own energy because they are also uh, generating power based on old coal-fired power plants or oil, um, all those things that they should no longer be working with. It's all very interesting, but now the last question, Weimar Triangle. So maybe, Jules, could you say something on our uh, Heinrich Böll Foundation ideas on the Weimar Triangle? And maybe we can hear from Margot Jatta whether you agree uh, to it or not. Thank you very much. I think this format uh, reflects the bilateral difficulties between Germany and Poland, for example, or France and Germany. We can overcome those difficulties. So it's an interesting format to, to overcome those um, problems, be it a uh, at the international uh, institutional level or at the government level, or whether it makes sense there, mm, I don't know. But there needs to be a political uh, solution. What we could do as a foundation is, I mean, there are similarities concerning the structural change. For example, transportation, the transportation sector in, in Germany, or nuclear power, the nuclear power sector in France, or uh, coal in Poland. And the idea might be to bring together people who are already very committed, very engaged in the energy sector in 
order to achieve an exchange of ideas and uh, a buildup of competencies. This is what we are working on as a foundation, also with our three European offices in Warsaw, Berlin and Paris. And we will hopefully generate good results. We'll meet in June in Paris for the first time after that. Uh, really uh, like uh, more cooperation between uh, all the three countries. However, on a very high political level, it political level, it seems not to be possible right now, unfortunately. However, I would like to see uh, more discussion and um, more information ex exchange, even on the lower uh, NGO on think, think tank level. Uh, as we consider there are many problems uh, uh, where we are all connected, for example, the transport and the diesel problem in Germany, uh, while you solve the problem, it, you bring problems to Poland because we, we will import all the old uh, diesel cars. And, uh, so, so this is also the problem, and of course our politicians uh, doesn't think about it, but we should think about it and we should discuss on it. Okay, yeah, wichtiges uh, Thema. Vielen Dank. Yes, this is indeed a very important topic. Thank you very much. I would like to thank you all for your uh, participation and interest in the European Energy uh, issue and the um, Energy Atlas 2018. I think we've all understood how important the energy discussion is at the European level when it comes to uh, integrating all the different member states and to let them participate in an energy transition. Thank you very much to all the panelists and also thank you very much to Rado Sina that you've come here from Brussels and thanks for the great cooperation. It wasn't always easy, but uh, Europe remains an interesting project and I'd just like to point out very briefly that um, on your seats you have um, what you call them uh, questionnaires uh, and you can help us by filling out those questionnaires to, you can help us to improve so please um, provide us with your filled out questionnaires. There will be a short reception. You can discuss with the panelists um, at the reception. And the next energy saloon, European Energy Saloon, will take place on May the 3rd at night on coal on the Balkans, in the Balkans. And you're kindly invited to that. I would like to see you all there. Thank you very much.